Hey, what's up, folks? About six months ago, so this is pre-apocalypse, I made a video about the idea of using OGR FDW, which is the Ogre foreign data wrapper for Postgres, as a kind of ETL tool or, or an ETL mechanism. So you would set up a connection to whatever Ogre can connect to, which is just about everything, and then use the fact that that looks like a local table just to pull that data across wherever you need it, um, just using plain SQL. And I actually made that, and it's been running for probably five months in Mecklenburg, and it runs perfectly. And I didn't share it because and I haven't decided whether this is because I'm becoming a mature and sophisticated software engineer or if I'm just anal and I need a hobby. But I never really liked it. Even though it was fairly simple, the way I architected it was just felt wrong. It just felt too complicated. There was this whole system of cascading failures. So if it failed at different stages, I. I say this is a failure at this stage and uh, it had the foreign uh, server and table just sitting in Postgres all the time. Now, I just don't like it even though it runs perfectly. So I had some time uh, yesterday and a little bit today to just reimagine that whole thing and now I'm super happy with it. So I put it on GitHub and uh, it's there for you to use. Now if you like it and you want to say nice things, don't say nice things to me. Uh, go say nice things to the OGRFDW folks because that is doing pretty much all of the work. I'm just making a simple node wrapper to fire off scripts and showing you what those scripts might look like. So let's take a look. Here is the whole... I, I, I'm not going blind. I actually... Uh, made sure that I upped the font size before I opened it this time. This uh, 40 something lines of code is really the whole thing because all it's doing is making a loop to loop through the ETL SQL scripts you've made in this jobs folder and that's all it does. And if things went well it logs it. If things didn't go well, it logs it with the error message. And that is about it. There are only two dependencies in the whole project, and that's a, a PG to connect to Postgres and .env to read a .env file. So you'll set up your connection information in a .env file to your Postgres server, and you are ready to go. You can just drop your transformations in this jobs folder and go. You run it by going node index.js and it will just uh, in series run these files. So I'm actually going to run in alphabetical order. Um, WFS takes a little bit longer than the other ones, but it's going to run through and it's going to log the results. It logs it to two places logs it to a CSV file in this folder and it also logs it to a table in Postgres. So that's it. If you want to run a single job, say you're working on something and you want to test it, you can go node index.js and the name of that job like shapefile.sql and it'll just run that one and, and log it. So what do these jobs actually look like? Because this is the important part. They are pretty straightforward. Uh, just let me go over this in the README file, uh, just so it's a little clear what these the sections are when you see it. This is using Postgres's uh, procedural language for SQL, and this lets you do things like if-then loops and, and stuff. So it's a little bit more like a programming language than just vanilla SQL, and we'll be taking advantage of that. So in our declare section, I'm putting variables here that I'm going to use in testing. Like if I need a variable to catch a value and hold that for a test, or if I want to say, set a variable to say the minimum number of records uh, that the source should have 
is X amount. If it doesn't have that many, just stop because something's going wrong. And that's where I set those variables. Then I create the OGRFDW server connection. I create the foreign table using that server connection. Set up any uh, test criteria. And if the test criteria passes, we'll run the update. Then I'll clean up the foreign server and table. That's about it. If you have any other kind of SQL you want to run after this job runs, you can just put it right in there. And this will all run as a transaction. So if you truncated your, your table and then an error happens on the insert, it'll be like the truncate never happened. So it should not leave you in a broken state if there's an error in your update script. Knock on wood. So how this looks, I, I have four example jobs on here. These won't actually run for you because you're not going to have the destination table set and in some cases you won't have the source data. Uh, but these are just examples of how this would work. So here I set two variables because I'm doing a, a record count test. So if there are less than 180 records in the source, I will not run the update. And this is like the number one thing that happens to jobs in Mecklenburg, I found, is that the job runs perfectly and it runs the update, but the source was empty. So you end up with an empty destination table and angry, angry phone calls. So I'm going to create the server, and this is creating a connection to a folder and say look for shapefiles there. And you can, I'll, I'll link the documentation for OGRFDW. Then I'm going to create a table that points to the voter polling location shapefile. And when you make this table, you have to tell it basically what's in that thing that you're getting in a way that uh, Postgres understands. You do not have to include every column in the source. You can just include what you need for your transformation. So once we have that layer set up, I'm going to check and see, and I called it this really obnoxiously long name because uh, I don't know why. So I'm going to see how many records are in there. And if the number of records are in there are greater than or equal to our minimum count of 180, then we'll truncate our destination table and we'll just throw those records right in. If this test failed, I'll raise an exception saying the minimum row count failed and that'll appear in the log. And then when it's done, I will drop the server, or drop, you know, not our production server, drop the, the foreign server and table. When you drop a server with Cascade, it'll get rid of any layers you defined based on that server as well. That's it. That's like 50 lines of SQL. And most of it is setting up your server and table. The only thing that we're really changing here from FDW, OGR FDW perspective is this part because the, the syntax and stuff will change slightly depending on the OGR data source. That's what it looks like for a shapefile. Uh, here I'm doing a, a WFS server. It's using GeoServer. So I'm giving it the syntax. I'm telling it to give, give me that layer from GeoServer as WFS. And then I'm doing the same sort of thing. I'm doing a test count and then I'm throwing the data in if it passes. Everything else is basically the same. I here I made an example of getting data from ArcGIS server. I know, I know, shut up. People use it. It's a thing. And here I'm of course I'm getting it as GeoJSON because ain't nobody got time for Esri JSON. And I'm getting uh, this is the URL. And this is Esri's COVID, county COVID data for North Carolina. So I define the table and there are a boatload of columns in this table. Just for this demo, I'm, I'm grabbing a few. Now in this case, uh, there aren't multiple tables that could be had here. For a GeoJSON source, the output layer is just named OGR GeoJSON and that's just a thing. So I do a count test for this one is there, make sure I got a hundred of those suckers, and then I do my update. For uh, Postgres, I'm actually connecting from the Postgres 
server to the same Postgres server, which I want to point out for the record, Paul Ramsey and those folks were way too classy to call a reach around connection when uh, they did the documentation on this. I have no such problems. So it's connecting to itself so I don't have to give it the password and server name and that kind of stuff in the connection. But this is what, with that extra stuff, a connection to a different Postgres server would look like. You just have another thing in here for the password and another thing for the server name. And if it's not the default, another thing for the port. So I'm defining that table. And this is what I'm doing an extra test. What I'm doing is I am taking an MD5 hash of the source and the destination to see if they're different. And if they are the same, I know nothing's changed and I don't need to run an update. So here I have two if thens and the MD5 will run a no change found exception. The other one will run a minimum row count failure as before. Everything else is the same. So these are just uh, uh, PLSQL files. Each one's a job. Each one's copying data from a different source into our server. And it all just works great. It's uh, The speed will depend on what you're doing. Like if you try to pull 200,000 records with 50 columns from a uh, you know, a, a web, like a WFS or a RGS server, that's going to take a while, but it all generally runs very quickly. Now, some things to note, uh, the log JavaScript, I made as a separate thing because you might want to dork with this. It logs two ways. It logs to this CSV file. It essentially calls this function, and here's where you can have it do different things. Logs that CSV file, and that will log to this table in Postgres if you have made this table. Otherwise, it'll just give you a message that it couldn't write to that table. You can comment that out if you want. You could. This would be the perfect place to add, say, uh, if there was an error, send me an email message or a text or uh, just you know turn the lights on and off. Just Whatever, this is where you'd stick that sort of thing. This is the only other bit of JavaScript besides the main uh, loop runner. Another thing to note, uh, these run in series. You could set up a loop in node to run in parallel. If you wanted to do that, I would just make sure that when you make your uh, server, your foreign server and foreign table names, that each uh, update script has a different name. Uh, it might be fine if they're the same, but I just, I imagine that if you had two jobs running parallel and they both set up the same uh, foreign server or use the same foreign server name, uh, Postgres might have an objection to that. Anyway, that's the whole shebang. Uh, when uh, they uh, set the flamethrowers on my work office, when we go back in there someday, uh, just because it'll be more convenient in there, I will start migrating my current scripts with the version of this I don't really like over to this. Uh, one other thing I should mention, the create server and create foreign table thing, you could have those, just run those on your server and they're just always sitting there. And you can take this entirely out of the script. I don't like that for two reasons. One, it it gets on my don't make a mess database admin nerves. And the other reason is it'll make it more difficult if I wanted to say take these scripts and point it at a different server. Because if I have them here, it'll just make those on the new server. And as long as the new server has access to whatever these sources are, you're good. If I don't have these here, I'll have to reset those back all up on a new server. And that sounds like a pain. Anyway, this is up on GitHub. I'll make links to that. And oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, if you're getting an HTTP source, make sure your server, if it's a Linux server, has CA certificates installed. Uh, that includes if it is a Docker image Otherwise, you're going to get a cert error. So if it's coming from an HTTPS source. 
that's it. That's all I got for you. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and happy. And uh, that's it. I can't think of anything else. I will catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye.